Well, good morning. My name is Brian Fury. I'm pinch hitting for Doug McBride, who's actually here today. He's usually not here when I'm up here because I'm <laughs> usually pinch hitting. Um, I've gotten a lot of comments this morning <clears throat> telling me that I am overdressed for Creekside. But, but you, you don't understand, and this is my typical answer when anybody says anything about what I'm wearing, I just do what Rhonda tells me to do, and that's all I do. And it's usually a wise thing to do. I've actually had people look at me and, you know, because I just can't put anything together, I really can't do the clothing thing. Um, and they'll look at me on a day that Rhonda hasn't had her input, and they'll go, is Rhonda sick? <laughs> Something's wrong here. So today, she caught me. We're going to pick up the passage that Tim was teaching us on and, and even go back to what chapter 17 is. It's Jesus' prayer to the Father. Um, the Last Supper has happened. They have moved from the location of the Last Supper on Mount Zion. They have walked down the valley, the Kidron Valley, up the other side to the Mount of Olives. They're undoubtedly in Gethsemane now. And Jesus is praying this final prayer to the Father. And as Tim showed us last week, he was praying for his disciples, the guys that followed him around for the last three years. And he prays for protection and for, for them to be one. And then now he's talking about another group. He's talking about the people who would believe in their word. Verse 20 says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone. That was the disciples that we studied last week. Not for these alone, but for those who would believe in me through their word. It's an interesting thing that Jesus, of course, is praying for his guys because they're going to face potential persecution and murder. It, it makes sense that he's praying to the Father that, that, that for eternal life to be known, that's the beginning of, uh, that this is eternal life to know the Father. These things all make sense, but this is a really unusual little twist. He's actually praying for people who have not been born. He's praying for us. He's actually in the Garden of Gethsemane thinking about us, those people who would come after him and after the disciples and after that first period of the church who would believe in their word. Because we don't have eyewitnesses. We, we can't just turn to Peter and Mark and, and, and say, well, what happened? We have the word. And, and um, I heard a quote recently. It said, the church is only one generation away from extinction. And that's been true for 2,000 years now. If we don't take the word, study the word, pass the word on to the next generation, the church dies because this is the source of our faith. The church will end because there would be no way to know Jesus without God's word. Without Jesus, there's no gospel. Without the gospel, there's no salvation. Without salvation, it's... It's over. The church is only one generation away from extinction, and that's been going on for 2,000 years. I think clearly God wants to keep it going. Verse 21, that they may be all one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. There's a lot of oneness going on in this part of Jesus' prayer. We looked at it last week with Tim. We're going to talk about it a lot today. And, and first I want to note, note something here, because it's very prevalent in these six verses we're going to look at today. There's a causality here. This thing causes that thing, and that thing causes this other thing. So we, we've seen it, the first one here, the Word. We're believing in the Word, and the Word is causing oneness. Because he says in verse 21, so that, the word is here, so that they may all be one. Because the word tells us who we are. The word tells us how we are connected. The word tells us how we are attached to the Trinity. And of course, it gives us our mission, why we're here. Tim talked about that last week as well. And we're going to talk more about this causality. We're going to look at how these things cause these other things as we go through this morning. But the goal is that they may be one, that, that we ourselves, this church that he's talking about, those who believe in his word, that we may be one. And, you know, I like to look up Greek words when, 
I think there might be something more there, some little nuance, especially simple words like the word one. So you look up the word one in Greek, and it means one. Doesn't mean two, doesn't mean several, doesn't mean many. It means one, singular. And it's actually profound in what it is not. What it is not, it is not separate. It is not divided. It is not individualism, however Christian unity celebrates the individual. Christian oneness celebrates diversity in, within the community. You can't have oneness without diversity. We're going to talk a lot about that today. You can't possibly have togetherness without celebrating your differences. Basic reason is, if you can't celebrate the differences, that means that people who are different, and we all are different from one another, you have to shut down part of yourself. Well, you can't have unity in that. You have to celebrate everybody's differences. And we have a God who celebrates difference, celebrates diversity. When you think about it, we are all made in the image of God. That's what the Bible teaches us. So which one of you looks like God? I mean, we all look different. And, and there's actually seven and a half billion people out there. We all look different. We think different. We have different personalities. We feel differently. We're all completely varied. And God says, well, this is how I display my image. Apparently, the image of God is so varied, so complex, so interestingly unique, that it takes seven and a half billion people to manifest that image. Isn't that cool? God is a celebrating God over diversity, over differences, because it takes so many to reflect who he is. And yet in all of that diversity, we are one. One in our original creation, we're made in the image of God, and one in our redemption, and that's what we're talking about here, the redeemed, the people who are being brought back into the original creation, that's what redemption's all about. It's actually restoring what was lost to bring us back to what we have originally with God. And in that kind of unity, there's tremendous diversity. Look at this. Paul highlights this to the early church. In 1 Corinthians 12, at verse 12, it says, For even as the, one, the body is one, he's talking about the body of Christ, even as the body is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also in Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we, and we were all made to drink of the spirit. By the way, when he talks Jews and Greeks and slave or free, those are the incredibly strong prejudices of the time. Jews wanted nothing to do with the non-Jew, which they called Greeks. They weren't all Greek, but they called them that. They wanted nothing to do with them. And slave and free, if you want to see a classism society, look at Roman society. If there were several classes, the lowest being the slaves, the, uh, uh, the top being the aristocracy, and they would wear certain colors. And if you wore a color that was outside of your class, you could legally be beaten in the street. They were completely prejudiced, the Roman world. Absolutely. You stay in your station and you don't move out. So Paul is hitting the most egregious prejudices and saying, even with those, we are one. Verse 20, but now there are many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head can't say to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, and he goes on to talk about spiritual gifts and how that was creating a rift in this church. But the point is made, we are one. We're very different, but we're all one. Putting it in more current terms, you might think, okay, well, my right arm could say, I don't want to be part of the body anymore. Well, actually, that's going to damage both parts. If I was to remove my right arm, it would damage my body, and it would damage the right arm. This is what Paul is getting at. We're one, and it's kind of silly to think that we're not, that, that people are not going to be damaged by us not living in unity. This says that all Christians are attached. We are part of the whole, and you can't detach part of the whole. In fact, oneness is not separable, thus the meaning one. Jesus keeps saying it, you, Father, in me, and me, in you, oneness in me, and you, and that Trinity unity, Doug has been talking about it. Jesus wants to bring us into that oneness, the kind of oneness that the Trinity has. 
You know, as a side, as we've been kind of learning this, how the Trinity acts in response, Tug has especially been leading the band on that, I've been asking myself, thinking, okay, why, why did the Trinity do all this? I mean, were the three of them bored? You know, why did they make angels? Why did they make us? Did the Spirit one day say to the Father, you know what? We got five billion times 80 trillion stars. Jesus is out making another one. Was he irritated? I mean, of course not. The Trinity has this perfect unity. They didn't need to do any of this, right? They didn't need to make angels. They didn't need to make us. However, that's actually a huge part of oneness. Oneness wants to expand the oneness. That, that's why our mission is to go out and bring other people into the oneness. And, and we know this from so, socially. We know this. I, I, we know this. When you have a friend who you really enjoy, and then you have a friend in some other environment you really enjoy, you, you want to get them together. I had this friend in college, and she, she was just a friend. She didn't date, but she was a gal in my Bible study. We just, she was like my sister. We had the best time together. She had an amazing sense of humor. And she was, she was going to some other church um, out of college, and, and she said, oh, you got to meet this guy. He's just like you. And so he, she, she got us together, and, and, and the three of us had, I don't know, triple the fun. It was great. Oneness wants to expand oneness. And that's what the Trinity wanted to do. This is an element of oneness. This is our mission, to expand that oneness. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Glory, apparently now, is part of oneness. It says here, it's another causal force. It's another force that causes oneness. First, the word is a causal force because it tells us that we are part of the Trinity and we are one with them. So that causes us to move into oneness. Now it says glory moves us into oneness. And Doug has identified what that glory is, which I'm so appreciative. I've been a Christian for 40 years. I've never heard anybody actually tell me what it is. He's identified it as adoring and praising, serving or pleasing, and always in love. And we can see this in the Trinity. We see it all through the New Testament. Jesus has been adoring and praising the Father. Jesus has done nothing but serve the Father, going where the Father is going, doing what the Father is doing, showing the Father honor, even by directing prayer to him. You know, when the disciples say, hey, teach us how to pray, he could have gone, well, just say, Jesus, can I have this? He didn't. He pointed to the Father. He says, no, no, ask the Father. Let me praise the Father. Let Let me adore the Father. Our Father who art in heaven. And the Father's been doing the same thing to Jesus. The Father has been empowering him to do amazing miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead. And remember Jesus' baptism, the Father opens up the sound waves of the sky and says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He does it again at the transfiguration and even adds, you should listen to him, praising uh, serving one another, always in love with one another. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit may be the most honored of all three. He's the one that stays with us, the redeemed, protecting us, guiding us, counseling us. And what does he do f- t- towards the other two? He interprets our prayers to the Father, Romans 8, and he continually reminds us of our identity in Christ. Praising, serving, and expressing love. Okay, so Jesus says that's the glory that's within the Trinity, and he wants us to have that same glory. Verse 23, I in them, in you and me, and that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as, even as you have loved me, and loved them even as you have loved me. So, so how does this unity happen for us? Well, it's that previous verse. It's through glory, through praising, serving, expressing love. You know, Doug did this a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about me, he was praising me. And he said, you know, when he went and did the pastor thing full time, I just kept the business running. And he was still full partner and full benefits of being a part. And as he was talking, I was like, I don't even know what he's talking about. I mean, I just never even thought of anything different. And, and this is the guy 
who was my first really good friend after, of course, we're after Rhonda, but really the guy who was really impacting me 30 years ago when I still had a lot of rough edges from my very ugly childhood. A lot of things unfinished in me. This is the guy who stuck with me a lot of times when I was not a great friend to him. And God really bonded our hearts together. And then when we started the business together, uh, after a, a while, I, I, Rhonda and I decided to build our own house, and, and I had budgeted a certain number for it. It was kind of like, okay, I can't expend any more than this, but I can afford this. And then, of course, we got into the project, like every construction project, and it costs more. And, you know, usually it's 10%, maybe 15% more. No, this was twice as much. And I, I mean, I was panicking. I was panicking, and Doug allowed me during that time. No, no, he insisted, he insisted that I take all of the profits from the business, and I did that for four years. He took nothing, and I took everything, and he insisted upon that, and I, I, it was like, he's got my back. Who is this guy? And it's funny. I knew I was going to tell you this story, and I shared these notes with Doug a few days ago, and in my notes, I said, I know as I say this, Doug will have no memory of what happened. And he'll kind of go, what are you talking about? And so then I get a text back from him after he read the notes, he's just ha, 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 ha. It's exactly what I said. There's something about oneness where you just don't do the math. You You just don't say, well, what are they getting? And what am I getting? And I getting enough out of this? Oneness just doesn't do the arithmetic. And it's opposite, absolutely opposite of the world that has to look out for number one. Oneness doesn't do that. Oneness is not concerned about number one. Oneness is concerned about the other. That's what this passage is about, doing the opposite of what the world calls us into. And it, it sounds crazy. I mean, then how do my needs get met if I have to be other-centered? I want you to imagine this. This is a church of 200, maybe 250 people. We only have 100-something, 150 people here on a Sunday, but it's about 250 people. What if we all took the Trinitarian attitude that as soon as we walk in that door, we're going to live out the glory of the Trinity. We're going to look to praise and encourage people. We're going to learn, look to serve other people, and we're going to always look to express love. What if we all did that? What if we all did that? That means as soon as you walk through the door, just doing the math, as soon as you walk through the door, you have 249 people looking out for you. If we all did that, that's what would happen. That's amazing. Who would not want to be part of that? And how could that not create oneness? That's beautiful. And that's what the call is. That's what Jesus' call is this morning in this passage. And, it, and it, it's this kind of other-centeredness is this, is this causal force again. It's living in the glory of the Trinity, being other-centered is what draws us into oneness and attracts other people to us. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus wants us to be with him. Isn't that cool? It's cool. It's cool when somebody just wants to be with you. I, um, it's going to sound a little sappy, but I've been married to Rhonda for 36 years. And every day I'm at work, around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I think, okay, what am I have to do this evening? Sometimes I disciple some guys in the evening. Sometimes we got stuff we got to go do. And it's like such a great feeling on those nights where I have nothing planned. I go, I can just go and be with Rhonda. I love that. She's so somebody I just love being with. I don't have to have an agenda. And I have a few friends like that. I just just love hanging out with them. This is literally what Jesus is saying about you and me. He just loves to hang out with you. He just wants to be with you. No agenda. Verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known you that you sent me. 
And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, it's a lot of tongue twisting there. But I'm actually really shocked by this passage. And I've been shocked over the last number of weeks that it's just becoming really clear how we are part of the Trinity's same kind of love that they have for each other that we're actually fully included in that love that they have going on, that they've had going on before all time. The Trinity is exercising glory on us. The Trinity is praising, serving, and loving us. Now, now the last two is kind of easy to see. It's easy to see that the, the Trinity serves us. They answer our prayers. They meet our needs. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. And of course, it's all about love. We merely need to look at the cross to understand how much we are loved by the Trinity. But that, that first one, that praise word, how is the Trinity praising us or encouraging us with words? Well, Ephesians 1.3 says this, praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has praised us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual praise in Christ. They have to watch a little bit on the translation of this. Some Bibles, I think they just, I think the translator is just, just insecure enough to not actually translate it the way it says, because they tend to say that God blesses us in the heavenly realms with every blessing in Christ. And, and that word blessing, I mean, I, I've always, I always looked at that verse when it translated in blessing. I go, it sounds good. I'm not sure what a blessing is, but sounds really good. And you look at the Greek, and the word is eulogio. It means a good word. It means a good report. And it means all through that verse, a good report. It means we give a good report to God. We praise God and it, because he has praised us. With every spiritual blessing, or with every spiritual praise in the heavenly realms. Well, how many spiritual praises could he do? Well, he's God. I mean, I think this verse is saying God is praising us. And I think he can't shut up about it. I mean, I think there could be the angels going, oh my gosh, there he goes again. Praising the saints. Oh yeah, they did this and they did that. And going on and on. I mean, it sounds stupid, but honestly, God cannot stop praising us. Doesn't that feel weird? I mean, it's just so unlike what we would think God. We tend to look at the dark sides of ourselves and think God is frowning on us. Actually, the dark side of us has been nailed to that cross. There's none of it left. All he has for us is praise. And we are brought into that Trinitarian love of praise and encouragement, of serving us and loving us, and they want us to live in that and express that to one another. This is what Jesus is praying about today. Now, before I close, I got a few more minutes. Um, I wanna talk about unity and what, what's happening in our society. There's a, there's a real quest for unity. A lot of being talked about. It doesn't use necessarily that kind of wording. But unity in our society today really is uniformity. And, and uniformity can actually never bring unity because uniformity requires conformity. You have to conform to the uniformity. And it's, so it's very different than the oneness Jesus is talking about. There's a, there's a quest today for uniformity, not disunity. And it, and it, and it I correctly identifies disunity and discord and all these factions in our politics and, and our society. It, dis, it, I think, correctly identifies them as bad and unpleasant. But the solution of uniformity can never, ever, ever bring unity. Because uniformity demands that anyone not like the others is oppressed, marginalized, ex excluded, punished. To coin a phrase, cancel culture. 
Cancel culture is about uniformity. It is not about unity. It sounds like it should be, but it is about uniformity. It is about conformity. You will conform to a predestined speech, perspective, belief system, belief system, or you'll be canceled, ignored, or cut off from your friends. Uniformity can never bring unity because it doesn't celebrate freedom. It doesn't celebrate differences. You have to conform. And it's really kind of ironic in the, some of the rhetoric today because the main topic of uniformity is diversity, which is such a beautiful term. But actually, if I have to be diverse, if I have to accept diversity as it's explained, but I can't have a diverse opinion, actually, that's not diversity, that's conformity. They celebrate diversity as long as it is in conformity with what they say diversity is. You guys feel that, right? That's kind of what's happening. But they definitely don't celebrate or even tolerate any diversion from the definition of what they say diversity is. That's not diversity, that's conformity. And therefore, it's oppressive, and we all feel it. And we all want the same thing. We all actually want unity. But we feel it. You know, and stepping back, you got to realize this, the quest is actually a really good quest. It's, it's trying to solve real problems of division in our society, of people hating other people because they're different, of racism, sexism, and all kinds of isms that make people feel marginalized and rejected. Actually, it's a really good quest. It's actually good that they want to end this kind of oppression, but you can't end oppression with oppression. It doesn't work. It's simply giving it a new name, painting a new face on it. Maybe it sounds more noble, but it's oppression trying to solve oppression. And, it, and it's happened throughout history. I mean, the most recent examples were in the 20th century with the Bolsheviks. They actually took a really good term and, 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 and interested people. Like, pe people are interested in diversity. It really does sound good because, I mean, we should love it. We have a diverse God. So they used this term communism 100 years ago, and it's great. It's actually, it's actually exercised in the Christian church. Let's look at the book of Acts, Acts 2.44. And all those who had, this is the early church, all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. That's beautiful. It's communism. It's absolutely beautiful. But, but is that what the Russians did? Is that what Mao did in China? No. They used the term to oppress people, probably with the biggest oppression that we've seen since the Romans. Because it's not about Christian values. It's not about love and care for others. It's not about being other-centered. It's not voluntary. Therefore, it's not like the early church. So why is Jesus in this prayer asking us to do something that has just so not worked in society? Oneness, it just hasn't worked. I think, I think there's one example I want to spend a few minutes on this morning where it actually kind of did work. Oneness in society. I want to quote from the Civil Rights Movement with Dr. Martin Luther King. I think it's a really interesting example. So it's from his I Have a Dream speech. He, he had, a, I think it was a million people marched onto Washington, D.C., and he spoke there. It was in 1963. And he says, I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts. He says, I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right down in Alabama, Little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as, as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. And then later on, he talks about letting freedom ring. And he says this towards the close. He says, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, 
When we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. What inspiring words. Where do you get those from? Let me read you Colossians 3.11, talking about the church. Paul says, Here there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So here's what he did. He took Christian doctrine and he projected it onto a secular society. And he said, here's what unity looks like. Here's, here's the vision. He gave vision, a vision that people go, oh, that's the goal. That's actually what we're looking for. And for the first time in 100 years, I mean, the Civil War was supposed to settle all this stuff. 100 years later, we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We have the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And, and you have racist white senators from the South voting yes on the dream, on the vision, on the inspiration. More recently, um, there have been various waves of trying to resolve the civil rights issue. And, and for me, this is, this is kind of personal. Uh, you guys know that um, I wrote a book about an African-American woman who saved my life when I was a kid. She was the only source of love in our family home when I was being raised. It was an abusive home. It was a violent place. There was no love in that home whatsoever. And I remember being three, four years old, just, just not understanding anything. But my parents watched the news every night, and I remember the images of George Wallace, this racist governor in Alabama, having the National Guard hook hoses up to the fire hydrants and hosing black people off the street, and then, and then complimenting it with attack dogs. And I was like three, and I remember looking at that. And I was like, these people who were being washed off the street like trash, they look like Liz, the only person, this black woman, the only person who loved me then. They looked like her. I, I just, it, it scarred me. It, it just, it, it's just left an indelible mark in me. And I know I bear white skin, but, but I just feel this deeply. So I really want this fixed. I, I've wanted this fixed from three years old. After writing the book, there were some people in, in Fresno that read the book, and I was invited to the West Fresno Missions Alliance. It's a group of black churches that has a, an alliance down there. There's about 50, 60 churches. And so I spoke at their 50th anniversary. They asked me to come and be the keynote speaker. There was 120 people there, all pastors and their wives, and um, I was a token white. Uh, I think there was a few of us, but... So it's, it's, it's an African-American audience. I'm telling them about my story. And at the end, you know, I, I share these words from Dr. King and how meaningful they are to me, even though I wear the skin. And it was when Black Lives Matter was, was first kind of coming on the scene and looking like it was the next fix or the, uh, the next attempt at fix and I thought, you know, this is on my heart. I'm reading Dr. King. I just have to say this. And I don't know, they have more right to have this opinion than I do because they wear the skin. But I just have to say it because this is how I see it. And I said, look, BLM is informational. And it, it's actually helpful for a white America to realize the work is not done. So it's informational, but it is not transformational. And I was shocked. I thought they would throw me out for being so bold. And instead, I had about 80% of the people nodding their heads. Yes, that's true. And because it's not transformational, it won't work. What Dr. King was doing was taking the thing that works, the vision of Christianity, and visioning it to the secular world, saying, this works. 
And this is what Jesus is telling us as a church. This works. Everyone on the planet wants unity. Every, every single person on this planet wants unity. Jesus is telling us how to do it. And then if we can do it, they'll notice and they can do it. Everybody wants peace and safety. Everybody, we, they, they want what we have. And you can argue, well, wait a minute, come on. Nobody wants Christianity. This is the land of the no God God. You can't even talk about God in a public way. No, no, they want what we have. They just don't know it's called Christianity. Jesus is, is, call, Jesus is calling us into this transformational relationship with the Trinity and with each other to, to show them who he is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you. I just don't have words to thank you enough that you have brought us into Trinity oneness, Lord. Teach us, teach us as Christians in this room, teach us as the, as the body of Christ that dwells at Creekside, teach us what that is, how we do that. Lord, guide us and teach us, and thank you. Thank you, you have brought us into that. In Jesus' name, amen.